Hello, I'm Simon Richardson. Welcome to this Coast is Queer session with Alan Hollinghurst. Alan is one of the UK's most critically acclaimed authors. Since his first novel, The Swimming Pool Library, was published in 1988, he's had a reputation as a lucid chronicler of gay life, and his six novels paint a picture of queer experience across the 20th century. He won the Booker Prize in 2004 for The Line of Beauty. His most recent book, The Sparshalt Affair, which was published in 2017, explores changing attitudes towards homosexuality in England between World War II and its decriminalisation that came in the 1960s. This event is part of the LGBTQ plus history club. Uh, thank you, Alan, for joining us for a slightly unusual conversation. Speaking of history, it feels a bit like we're living through it at the moment. How are you faring in lockdown number three? Well, I'm faring okay. I mean, it's been very, very long, this whole experience, hasn't it? And very, very sad. You know. um, I haven't myself lost anybody very close to to me, but I've had a lot of friends who've had it very badly. It was so terrifying when it started, and a year ago nearly. Um, and then I was interested by how quickly I kind of accommodated the idea and adjusted myself to the, these new conditions. And I'm realizing more and more now how terribly I miss the stimulus of uh, contact with friends, travel, all that. You know, I mean, in a way, for, for a writer. Any number of lockdowns is quite a good idea because it gives you the, the uninterrupted time to get on with work. Um, but actually, something else vital is, is missing. So it, I, haven't, I haven't been as productive in this time as I rather wish I had. Yeah, I heard Neil Gaiman say recently that without the caprices and random encounters right. of modern life, he was kind of drying up creatively. Yeah. So is that you, you're, you're sort of similar? I'm not drying up, no. And I, I have actually been getting, getting on with a, a new book. Um, but I feel really, by now, I ought to have the complete manuscript stacked on my desk, and I'm still only about a third of the way through. So. Well, let's turn to the subject of history then. As I said, your books are set over a lot of different historical moments from the 19th century until much closer to now. What's the allure for you of writing about the past? I think I was always interested from my when I started in, in writing about the gay past, because um, and I think it's because so much of the gay past was hidden. I don't think I would be interested in writing a historical novel of a more general kind, you know, but um, it's rather hard now to quite re remember what, what conditions were like back then. Um, but the, the Sexual Offences Bill became law when I was 13, 1967. And then, although the law changed overnight, the sort of attitudes... Um, changed much more slowly, and there was a very there was a gradual sort of opening up of this whole hidden subject of homosexuality, and I felt very fascinated by that as a young man, as a student. I did a um, a graduate thesis at Oxford about uh, gay writers like E. M. Forster, who hadn't been able to write openly about their sexuality, and then what happens when these restraints are removed. Um, so this led me into looking at sort of the, the buried gay, gay history of the later 19th and 20th centuries quite a lot. And then I think when I came to write the, the Swimming Pool Library, this suggested itself as a kind of model for the, the book. And you could have someone living, a young man living rather heedlessly in the present day, um, but discovering through meeting a much, much a man who's as old as the century, um, the, these episodes in, in a, a gay history of which he really knew nothing at all, and culminating in a very big one, which um, turns out to sort of in involve him and his family. Um, and I think, I suppose I'm someone who's always had quite a strong sense of the past, um, but I'm generally juxtaposing it with the present, tracing um, the effects of things in the past on the present. And I think also it's, you know, I'm now in my mid 60s, so as life gets longer, you have more and more to remember and to look back on. Um, so, I've, and the, the subject of the passing of time has become more and more interested, interesting to me. So, I'm writing, I do seem to be writing books which cover 50 or 80 years. Um, and uh, you know, there may be other reasons for it, I can't quite analyze myself, but um, certainly, sort of excavating a little 
a little moment in the past where um, some some fascinating thing is buried um, has has always intrigued me very much. It's interesting you mentioned that moment of liberation in the sixties. I'm sort of surprised to to realise that it's fifty years this year since. Morris was published, That's which, right. you know, it's funny, isn't it? Because, of course, that book feels like it's 100 years old, yes. um, but it couldn't be published while Forster was alive. And, um, you know, it was a kind of secret talisman between writers, wasn't it, that book? It's amazing, Absolutely, really. yeah. Yes, it was what, um, a, a book he wrote between two successful books which were published and then sort of tinkered with it again later on in his life but as you say sh shared it with younger writers like Christopher Isherwood and so on so it had a sort of cryptic presence through through the century um, and then yes then after Forster's death it was published quite promptly um, and then the, that book of stories The Life to Come some very good gay stories which he had obviously also hadn't published in his lifetime um, I mean, that's another thing about trying to remember what the conditions were at a particular historical moment, because now it seems so axiomatic that Forster was a, a gay writer, and mm. we think of him. But during his lifetime, of course, no one had said that publicly. He never said it publicly himself, although he sort of stood up for the rights of the individual against sort of oppressions of all kinds and so on. Um, and it would have been known amongst his circle. And probably, it's very, that question of what people knew at the time when these things weren't talked about, it's very hard to, to, to analyze now. To what extent was it at all part of the public consciousness of Forster that he was gay? You know, it's very hard to know. Um, but now, you know, in the, those 50 years, our, our whole understanding of, of him and his significance has, has changed. Well, I want to talk more about reputation and, and the idea of literary biography. I know that you're very interested in it. It's a preoccupation in several of your books. Um, Will Beckwith in the Swimming Pool Library is asked to write a biography of, of an older gay man. And uh, the main character in The Folding Star, Edward, he's employed by a curator who's keen to airbrush certain elements of the life of the painter that he idolises. But the book that's most kind of explicitly deals with it, I think, is The Strangest Child. That's the, about the pop, that's about the posthumous reputation of a World War I poet who died called Cecil Valance. Why are you so interested in what goes into the making of biography, do you think? I think it's a, another side of what we were just talking about, uh, the fact that you could read, for instance, the biography of Edward Marsh, who was um, Winston Churchill's private secretary, um, who published um, some very influential, massively selling books called Georgian Poetry through the years of the First World War, um, who was Rupert Brooke's literary executor and wrote a, uh, a memoir of Rupert Brooke, uh, which is the most preposterous sort of whitewash of his, his character. And Marsh himself was clearly rather in love with Rupert Brooke. His liter uh, Rupert, uh, Rupert Brooke's friend and obviously someone else who was sort of infatuated with him, Geoffrey Keynes, um, sort of half a century after Brooke's death, p published his letters, heavily doctored. You know, sort of um, and it was only within the last 20 years or so that a, a sort of frank account of, of what this, this young idol, Rupert, Rupert Brooke, was like, that actually became available. So I, I was sort of, I was interested in, in creating a, a figure rather like that. Someone who's not himself a, a very significant artist, uh, but who writes a poem which sort of catches the national mood, um, and then in all the all the various vested interests which try to sort of prevent the truth about him coming out. So really, it was a way of tracking that thing we were talking about at the beginning of uncovering the the gay, the hidden gay subject, um, which has, has been determinedly buried by the family and other close pe people close to this dead person throughout the century. Um, and you get that moment, which is that moment of the 70s and 80s, really, when the, the truth about gay lives is suddenly being told again. And there's a great deal of reclaiming of, of gay history and often perhaps a little bit of overexcited kind of <laughs> determination that people were much gayer than they were. You know. um, but um, so I think it was that sort of that sequence of suppressions and revelations that, that interested me about, about that uh, story. 
that idea between the public memorial and the private memorial. We've got a reading, I think, from The Strangest Child that you're going to give us that, that talks a little bit about that. Could we hear it? Yeah. This is from the second section of the novel, which is set in 1926. Um, Cecil Valance has been killed in the war, um, and at the country house of his fam, the Valances, there's a chapel in the house, and um, Cecil's mother has had a marble, a tomb with a marble effigy of Cecil um, placed in, in the chapel. Um, and this whole section takes place in a weekend where uh, people are being gathered by the, the person who's going to write a memoir of the dead Cecil, employed by the mother and very much under her control, um, called Sebastian Stokes. And he's come down and they, they've all gathered there to contribute their little bit of a, a memory of the dead, dead figure. Um, and it soon turns out that no one's really allowed to say, say what they know or what they think. Um, and in this scene, George Saul, who is had an affair with Cecil at Cambridge, goes into the chapel by himself. He sort of escapes into the chapel to have a look at the monument um, and is then surprised that in, in the chapel by Sebastian himself. Cecil was laid out in dress uniform with rich attention to detail. The sculptor had fastened his attention on the cuff badges the captain's square stars, the thin square flower of the military cross. The buttons shone dully in their strange new light, brass transmuted into marble. Who was it? George stooped to read the name, which was dashingly signed along the edge of the cushion, Professor Farinelli. Dashing and a touch pedantic, too. The effigy lay on a plain white chest with less readable lettering, gothic and plaited, running right round it in, in a long band. Cecil Tusa Valance, M.C., Captain, 6th Battalion, Royal Berkshire Regiment, born April the 13th, 1891, fell at Maricor, July the 1st, 1916, crass ingens iterabimus equor. It was a thoroughly dignified piece of work, in fact, magnificently proper. It struck George, as the chapel itself had on that first day, as a quietly crushing assertion of wealth and status, of knowing what to do. It seemed to place Cecil in some floating cortege of knights and nobles, reaching back through the centuries to the Crusades. George saw them for a moment like gleaming boats in a thousand chapels and churches the length of the land. He gripped Cecil's marble boot caps and waggled them sulkily. His hand waggled, the boot caps eternally not. Then he edged round to look at the dead man's face. He remains contemplating Cecil and the past for a moment until Sebastian Stokes comes in. Ah, Mr. Saul, you startled me. Well, you startled me, said George equably. Oh, <laughs> my apologies. Stokes walked around the tomb with a firmer expression, frank but respectful, so that you wouldn't tell what he thought. Quite a fine piece of work, don't you think? May I call you George? It seems to be the style here now, and one hates to appear stuffy. Of course, said George, I wish you would, and then wondered if he was meant to call Stokes Sebi, which seemed an unwarranted jump into familiarity with a man so much older and so oddly, almost surprisingly, distinguished. It's not a bad likeness by any means, Stokes said. Often I'm afraid they don't quite get them if they haven't known them. I've seen some very hand-me-down efforts. Yes, said George, out of courtesy, but feeling, now the subject was being aired, more critical and proprietary. Of course, I didn't see him later on, he admitted, but I don't quite feel I've found him here. He drew his fingers thoughtfully down Cecil's arm and glanced for an abstracted moment at the marble hands which lay idly on his tuniced stomach, almost touching the hands of a sleeper. They were small and neat, somewhat stylized and square, in what was clearly the professor's way. They were the hands of a gentleman, or even of a large child, untested by labour or use. But they were not the hands of Cecil Valance, mountaineer, oarsman, and seducer. If the captain's neat head was a well-meant approximation, his hands were an imposture. George said, and of course the hands are quite wrong. 
Yes, said Stokes with a momentary anxiety, and then a little reluctantly. No, I think you're right, a sense of their unequal intimacies in the air. But when did you last see him yourself, I wonder, said George. Oh, well, Stokes looked at him. It must have been ten days before he was killed. Oh, well, there you are. He was on leave unexpectedly, you know, and I, I invited him to dine at my club. Stokes said this in a natural, practical tone, but it was clear the invitation had meant a great deal to him. How was he? Oh, he was splendid. Cecil was always splendid. Thank you. It's interesting. You're making us think there. George feels proprietorial, uh, faced by Cecil's, bio, you know, his, the person who's going to write a memoir about him. So we're thinking about who owns Cecil's legacy. And exactly. also, I love how he says, I don't feel I've quite found him here. That sort of sums it all up, really, gay history, doesn't it? The alienation yeah. that we might feel from the kind of monumental history that the world writes that leaves us out. Exactly so, yes. Secrecy is an important theme in The Strangest Child. Uh, George and Cecil are both members of uh, a Cambridge society. Um, and I wondered whether it was easier as a writer to write about queer lives before they became legal, when they were still covert, whether, that was more, whether that's more attractive to a writer. I wouldn't want to generalise. It certainly seems to have been attractive to me. Uh, and I've, I'm always fascinated by things that are, that are not said uh, and things which are uh, sort of conveyed but not made explicit and so forth. Um, and sort of the undertones of conversations and relationships. Um, and I think it is fascinating write, writing about life which is being lived under peculiar... Um, constraints of, of secrecy and codes and so on. Um, I mean, it's, it's not uninteresting writing about life which, which is led without those, those restrictions. And I think, that, you know, I've, I've always enjoyed doing both. Um, but it gives to the gay life of the more distant past this, this further very fascinating dimension, I think. Um, and I, that clearly is something which has sort of repeatedly appealed to me. Uh, I mean, I think gay lives, they're so underwritten about, really. I know when I started writing The Swimming Pool Library, I just had this sense of an extraordinary kind of gift, you know. It was the, this vast area of human experience, which no one had explored in a candid sort of way in, in the literary fiction. Um, and I thought it was an amazing opportunity, and I've, I've continued to feel that. Um, and, you know, it's fascinating writing about something like gay life because you're writing about something which is, is never still. And uh, it, it's something which is constantly developing and changing. Um, and I suppose that's another another reason for writing these books that, like The Stranger's Child, you know, which, which cover nearly 80 years, that that, uh, that you can map or take, take sort of sample moments from different epochs with their different morality and ethos and even in the candid modern era of of grinder and so you know there are a lot of things which are still not being said um, there, there, there are secrets and confusions and um, i mean the subject the subject is inexhaustible really you talked about the swimming pool library which came out in 88 um that doesn't necessarily look like the best moment to begin a career writing specifically about gay lives I know Edmund White was one of your early admirers. Who were you writing for, do you think, when you, when you made this bold move into writing these openly gay, unashamed, uh, you know, uh, energetic characters? I don't think I had a sense of, of writing for anyone. I mean, there's that peculiar sort of secret excitement, secrets again. Uh, which it, which it's uh, about writing a first novel, which it's hard to convey and certainly impossible to recapture. You know, but you're you're doing something nobody knows about. No one has any expectations of it. Um, I was I had a full time job at the time, so I could have wrote it in the evenings and at weekends, and it was just this other other place I I went to. Um, and I think that generally I'm someone who's written without a sense of a specific audience. Um, I probably had a sense that. There was already a, a body of sort of new gay writing which was being published by people like the Gay Men's Press and so forth, uh, which was writing 
maybe by gay men, for gay men, published by gay men, um, uh, which was great. And you know, quite a few books published by the Gay Men's Press ma made a big Im impression on me at that that time. But I think I felt that this actually was a was a subject which everybody might might be expected to be interested in, uh, and that I wasn't writing it for a sort of niche audience, but you know, for a larger one. And, and that part of the point of the book was to sort of in integrate this this gay story into the, the larger British social picture. Um, so, um, and I think as I've gone on, I've tended just to, to write to meet the the needs of my own projects, you know, the, the technical challenges I've set myself, the story that I'm, I'm writing. I, I mean, occasionally I think so-and-so might like this passage or somebody might get that joke or, but um, I don't think of myself as writing for anyone. Um, I mean, it's a very fascinating question that, and um, it became a particularly acute one, I think, during the, the years when that book was published and the decade of the 80s and early 90s with the, the AIDS crisis going on, uh, because there was a sort of general assumption that a, a, a gay writer would tackle this subject of, of AIDS, which was one of immense importance. And a lot of novels were written immediately out of the, the crisis. Um, and I think something in me just sort of told me that I didn't want to do that, uh, that I resisted the pressure to, to to tell a story just because of who I was in, in a particular moment. Um, and I skirted round it, really, in my second and third books. It sort of touches on them, but uh, it was really only in the, the Line of Beauty, which I wrote at the beginning of this century, um, that... I felt able to, sort of, again, integrate the, the story of AIDS into a larger picture of the, the 1980s. Um, there was something about the AIDS story itself which was sort of, I found very difficult to tackle artistically. You know? it, it has a certain ineluctable shape. Um, someone's well, then they get ill, then they get more ill, then they die. Um, and it was a, a difficult and depressing subject. Um, and I think I, I just knew that it, I didn't want to, to deal with it then. But I was, a, I was aware in various ways that pe people felt I should be doing that, and that um, by suddenly writing a book a, about an English tutor in Belgium, you know, I, I was somehow uh, ev evading a responsibility to the gay, uh, the gay community. Or, um, but um, I've never, never wanted to think of myself as any sort of spokesperson. You know? I think that the interest of a, of a novel is, is the uh, expression of an individual temperament. Um, so I've always been sort of wary of meeting expectations, which is perhaps another, another answer to your question about who I'm writing for. You know? Like every gay man living at that time, you were you know, your life was impacted, but I think more so than some, a close friend of yours was actually one of the first British people to die of AIDS. Is that right? Yes. I mean, I wonder if now when the first cases really happened. Um, this was in, yes, November 1984, uh, and it was certainly early enough on for everybody to be terrified, no one to know what was going on. Uh, it was very, very quick. Um, and um, extremely shocking, and, and the sense of something which one had read about at a distance suddenly striking very close to home. You know? um, and that was, I think, the, the moment that uh, there was a friend of mine called Nick Clark, who was a brilliant young art historian, and a, a person who'd been very sort of exemplary to me, a, ve a very um, sort of ex exquisitely dressed, bold, daring, uh, person who one of the figures who'd actually uh, sort of introduced me into London, the London gay scene, and so on. Um, so it was he was a sort of as well as a close friend. He was a very he was a sort of representative figure to me somehow, um, and I dedicated that first book to his memory. Let's have a reading then from your novel, which does touch m more explicitly on the, the HIV AIDS crisis. Let's have a reading from uh, The Line of Beauty. Yeah. Well, this is a book in three parts, and this I get to read from the final section set in 1987. Um, 
Nick Guest, the protagonist, um, in, in the first section of, of the book in 1983, we've seen him embarking on his first ever gay affair with a, um, a black man slightly older than him called Leo. Um, and in this section, four years later, uh, Nick's life has changed in all sorts of ways, and he's approached by Rosemary, Leo's sister, to give him the news that uh, Leo has died of AIDS. Um, so I'll, I'll just read a couple of pages from the scene where she, where she comes with her friend Gemma um, to, to break the news to, to Nick. The first thing she passed him was a small cream-coloured envelope addressed to Leo in green capitals. He felt he knew it and he didn't know it, like a letter found in an old book. It had a postmark of August the 2nd, 1983. She nodded and he opened it while they watched him. It was like learning a new game and having to be a good sport as he'd lost. He unfolded a little letter in his own best handwriting and the photo slipped out into his lap. That's how we knew where to find you, Rosemary said. He had sent it in the blank envelope to Gay Times, doubting how it could survive, how his own wish could take on form and direction. And someone there with a green biro had sent it on. He was seeing the history of his action and seeing it as Leo himself had seen it, but distant and complete. He picked up the photo with the guarded curiosity he had for his earlier self. It was an Oxford picture, a passport-sized square cut out from a larger group, the face of a boy at a party who somehow confides his secret to the camera. He only glanced at what he'd written on the Fedon's embossed letterhead, the small size meant for social thank yous because he hadn't had much to say. The writing itself looked quaint and studied, though he remembered Leo had praised it. Hello, he'd begun, since of course he hadn't yet known Leo's name. The cross stroke of the H curled back under the uprights like a dog's tail. He saw he'd mentioned Bruckner, Henry James, all his interests, very artlessly, but it hadn't mattered, and indeed they had never been mentioned again when the two of them were together. At the top, there was Leo's annotation in pencil. Pretty? Rich? Too young? This had been struck through later by a firm red tick. Nick folded it away and peeped at the two women. It was Gemma's presence, the stranger in the room, that brought it home to him. For a minute she seemed like the fact of the death itself. She didn't know him, but she knew about the letter, the affair, the tender young Nick of four years ago, and his shyness and resentment went for nothing in the new moral atmosphere like that of a hospital where everything was found out and fears were justified as diagnoses. He said, I wish I'd seen him again. And he didn't want people seeing him, said Rosemary, not later on. Right, said Nick. You know how vain he was. It was a little test for her grief, an indulgent jibe with a twist of true vexation at Leo's troublesomeness, alive or dead. Yes, said Nick, picturing him wearing her shirt and wondering if the man's shirt she had on now was one of his. He always had to look his best. He always looked beautiful, said Nick, and the exaggeration released his feelings suddenly. He tried to smile, but felt the corners of his mouth pulled downwards. He mastered himself with a rough sigh and said, of course, I haven't seen him for a couple of years. It's just impossible for anybody who didn't live through that crisis to imagine what it must have been like. Um, who for you are the writers who've best captured it, do you think? Um, I mean, I think a lot of the books that came out at the time you know, probably haven't lasted. And to me, the, um, the one that most magnificently deals with it is Edmund White's uh, Farewell Symphony, um, you know, which takes that idea of Haydn's farewell symphony where the, the protesting orchestra members one by one leave the stage till there's only one person there. Um, and um, for, for the kind of emptying out of, of, of the gay world, the New York gay world in particular by, by AIDS. Um, and it forms the third part of a, movingly forms the third part of a sort of 
autobiographical chronicle, which when Edmund started writing it, he could have had no idea where it was going to go. Um, starting with a boy's own story and the beautiful room is empty. Um, and it's as if he, he's embarking on a sort of truth-telling mission about his own life, um, which is headed for this, this great catastrophe, which no, no one could have anticipated. Um, and it's, a, it's a really magnificent novel. I re read it again two or three years ago when I was writing a new introduction to Boy's Own Story and thought it even better than I had you know, when it came out. The, um, that reticence you talk about for writing about it, is, I think is completely understandable. Um, I don't know if you've seen Russell T. Davis's new drama, It's a Sin. Uh, you know, the crisis is certainly going to be back in the public imagination because of that. It's so good. But he talks about how long it took him to be able to tackle that subject. Very interesting. Now I'm looking forward to that. Um, I um, Yes, because he hasn't really addressed it directly before, has he? It's I think the word AIDS isn't actually uttered once in Queer as Folk. No, fascinating. Which is yeah. amazing, isn't it? It yeah. is, isn't yeah. it? yes. Um, no, I, I, I look forward very much to that. Um, it is really important that that story is told via whatever medium, I think. Um, but I worry that myself that there feels like there isn't enough dialogue between generations of, of queer people. Um, your novel, The Spell, which was published in 98, features lots of friendships and relationships between old and young gay men. Why did you want to put those in that book? Well, I think it's been part of the pattern all along, hasn't it? From you know, the first book being this sort of uh, interleave narratives of, of a young man and an old one, as it were. Um, what, what can the young, the, the ignorant or uh, forgetful young uh, le learn of, of value from? From the older generations, um, and in a way, that's the sort of model for everything we've been talking about. This the sort of uncovering of the past, um, not only not forgetting, but actually having to learn about the past. Um, and I, I think, uh, to me, friendships with older gay men were always very important. Old, older people generally, actually, I think. Um, and I would, when I was young, I always liked the company of of older people, uh, and I. I like absorbing the, sort of the, the, the knowledge of the, the stories of, of people in, in earlier generations. Um, and I, it takes on, yes, in the spell, it takes on more specifically a sort of se sexual nature because they're, I mean, they're not huge gaps. I mean, in the Spa Shelter Fair, I have sort of affairs of people that are sort of 30 years apart in, in age. Um, as I get older and older myself. I get, uh, but yes, that, but between people in their twenties and thirties or forties in the spell, um, I think there. Yes, I have. I have the character of, of Alex, who's um, who's someone who's the big affair. He was the relationship he was having has has ended, uh, and he in his mid. I mean, he's only in his mid thirties, but but he, he's feeling very sort of um, lonely and disconsolate and rather withdrawn from. From, from life, um, and he meets um, a boy, Danny, who's 20, 22, um, someone living very sort of actively on the London gay scene, um, high-spirited, sort of he he hedonistic, attractive. And um, that, I suppose, is the case of it working the other way around, in a way, that, that, that Alex learns something or, or, uh, about sort of regaining his, his mojo, if you like, from, from, from this pers person who's perhaps about 15 years younger than him. Well, uh, you've beautifully queued up our next reading, Alan. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, Which is a kind of induc induction in, uh, yes, by the younger person toward the older person. But yeah, it's right, not quite right. intergenerational. I think that's true. It's not quite intergenerational. Um, yes, Danny. Uh, meets up with Alex and takes him out to a huge gay club um, and gives him his first tab of E. And uh, he, he can see that Alex is in, in need of a good deal of disinhibition. Um, and Alex, Danny is sort of coming up. Um, Alex is taking rather a long time to do so. 
Uh, so they're in the cloud with thousands of half-naked men milling around. Uh, Danny said, as if unaware of a break in the conversation, Wow, how are you feeling, darling? Fine, I, I don't feel anything much yet, with an exaggerated desire not to exaggerate, to be sure of whatever happened when it did. He looked at his watch. How long? 45 minutes. Just sit back, breathe deeply, don't fight it, Alex, with a tiny spurt of annoyance, as if the novice was stubbornly defying the master. He did as he was told, and found himself putting an arm round Danny, his fingers playing dreamily on his bare biceps, his head against the wall, rocking as the music climaxed and broke off in gorgeous piano chords. Mm, this music's fabulous, I know. What do you call this music? It's house. So this is house. Why is it called that? Not sure, actually. It's fabulous. I know. Danny smiled at him with what might already have been the tenderness of love when it is first revealed. Go with it. Think what you want. Say anything you want. He didn't know about that. He closed his eyes and snorted in air as if about to dive for something he'd lost. Now Danny's arm was looped over his knee, his hand fondly but abstractly stroking his shin, which had never seemed so sensitive a place. The music pounded and dazzled, but had its origin in somewhere subtly different, grand and cavernous. Yet when Danny spoke again, he didn't need to shout. It was as if they'd been granted a magical intimacy in the heart of a thunderstorm. What he said was, fuck, this is good. And then again, with what seemed an angelic concern, tell me straight away if you don't feel all right. Alex felt a trace of shyness still, because what he wanted to say was deeply to do with Danny. He closed his eyes, and his mind sped ahead down the glittering tracks of sound. It wasn't a hallucination, but he saw his own happiness as wave on wave of lustrous darkness, each with a glimmering fringe of light. The words, when they came, were totally inadequate, but he knew at once that Danny would understand them and read his indescribable sensations back into the tawdry syllables. He said, I feel ravishingly happy. I've never felt so happy. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. And, and uh, particularly enticing in this time when none of us uh, are going out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't sort of, you know, I'm a bit past going out now, but, yes, but I, it, how, how I'd love to do that. Yes, in any context, you know, <laughs> yes, not, not even a club full of half-naked men. No. <laughs> um, and appropriately, you do seem to be a fan of writing about parties, Alan. Um, yes. The spell has several. The line of beauty flits between glamorous parties. Why is that, do you think? What do you enjoy about bringing people together in that way? Sometimes it's just a technical thing, you know. The Line of Beauty is, um, is a, a novel with quite a big cast and sort of social span, but uh, the entire thing is seen through the eyes of one person. So um, a party is a very useful way of, um, sort of bringing a whole lot of people together for, for your sort of central person to uh, interact with and observe. Um, it also seemed to me in that book, which is about the sort of Glory is, if that phrase could possibly be used, of sort of high Thatcherism, uh, with a lot of ostentatious, rather competitive party going was was taking place, uh, and, the, and the big, the lavish party seemed seemed a good sort of uh, de device, sort of symbol almost of that that period. Um, I think I've always been interested in in sort of disinhibition and people drink drinking, sort of the, the changes in behavior. And it's that thing of saying things and not saying things, you know, the things that you allow yourself to say or to do when you've had a few. Uh, and um, yes, yeah, so and the, the idea of, of entering a sort of altered state, sort of leave, leaving social normality into, into something which seems charged with greater significance, even though, you know, it's just a drug, uh, is, uh, I, I, you're right, I've always found that quite, quite fascinating to write about. Um, as we heard in that reading, um, you're very good at exploring sensations and situations, the way you manage to define them so precisely. How central is that to your task as a writer, to your vocation as a writer, do you think? Well, it's sweet of you to say that. I've, uh, I absolutely love describing things. You know? I think that's really one of my main pleasures as a, as a writer, and um, trying to get exactly what something feels or sounds or most difficult of all smells like 
uh, on, onto the page um, and to convey exactly how people sound and look when they're saying or doing something. Um, that those uh, questions are, they seem to me somehow to be rather rather central to the, the job of the novelist um, and a way of bodying out this this sort of insubstantial thing which is just words on a page. I mean, a novel is a strange invitation to a reader to imagine the world of the book him or herself you know um, and, I, and I love that that thing about the, the novel that uh, it's the one art form which is completely individual to every person who approaches it unlike a, a film or a play or anything else. Often they're seeing things which are wildly different because people are bringing their own experience and their own imagery to things. Um, so that whole, whole world of, of making that, guiding the reader and giving them the most a accurate, um, helping them to, to feel most accurately what I'm trying to convey um, is sort of one of the central tasks, I think. You like writing about people having fun, but I also read a quote from you where you said you have to avoid the urge to chuck your characters off a cliff. <laughs> 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 um, probably, probably out of context. But what exactly did you mean by that? Well, it's just part of the kind of supreme power that you have as a as a novelist. You know, what the hell you like with your character? Um, and I think um, partly, perhaps, because I was interested in, in re resisting co conventional narrative forms, you know, and, and certainly for a long time not really interested in the happy ending. There's a politics to that, isn't there? Because, of course, queer people in books were, were robbed of happy endings for a, a long yes, time. Yes, it's true. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I didn't, you know, I never wanted to write queer people like queer people in, in old books and film were, you know, who were sort of suicidal loners and so on. Um, and the, the, whole, the whole project felt different from, from the start, I think. Um, but terrible things do happen in, in or are revealed to have happened in, um, the first two books. And I think when I came to write The Spell, I did actually, the last page of the book, the four main characters were all kind of gathered on the edge of the tall Literally. cliff in Dorset. <laughs> yeah. and I thought, we, we could have some marvellous disaster here. <laughs> and the, the strong wind blows them all into the English channel. Um, but, I, but I resisted it. And um, uh, again, the, the line of beauty has, has a, an ambiguously kind of quite dark ending. Um, but Sparshalt, um I sort of where a lot of sort of difficult things have, have happened. Um, I, I rather turned again, and and, um, and the book, the penultimate section of the book, goes through a, a period of grief and loss in a man's fifties, um, but then emerges again into a much sort of happier, uh, unexpectedly uh, fruitful and sort of optimistic final section. Um, so I, I think I have mastered that. That urge to, to, to bump my character as well. <laughs> we talked about biography earlier, and I'd like to ask you a little bit about your own biography. Um, you won the Newdigate Prize while you were a, a Gosh, student. Yes, I did. Um, you must have known for a very young age that you wanted to be a writer. Is, is that true? I was always writing through my teens, yes. I mean, poetry was what I mm. mainly wrote. I wrote masses of poetry when I was at school. Um, I started writing sort of experimental novels in the sixth form uh, and carried on doing that. Um, I started writing a gay novel when I was a graduate student at Oxford. I don't think I wrote more than um, 30 pages of it, perhaps. Um, it's very difficult writing a, something as long as a novel when you're young because your ideas change so fast and actually writing a novel takes a great deal of time and stamina so you just sort of grow out of things you know so I left the sort of stumps of various novels that never went very far uh, whereas writing poems was much much easier um, and I think yes I did feel whether it is something to do with the, the sort of the unspoken gay things I don't know um, you know a lot of straight people were writing poems as well so it probably wasn't but um, but the sense that this was a a dimension in which I could express myself, was, I think, was part of my m makeup from you know puberty onwards, probably. Yeah. You talked about the gay men's press earlier and how those 
those works had meant a lot to you. Could you could you name a few and, and a few of the other things that you were reading around that time when you first, you know, when you were just coming to publishing? Well, I suppose, um, I mean, Gaiman's Press published new fiction. It also sort of rediscovered memoirs, like the memoir by T.C. Worsley. And it, 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 I mean, books which are now probably sort of half forgotten again already, you know, it's, that's a strange sort of cycle of revivals and disappearances. Um, the gay writers that I was, I mean, Edmund White's Boy's Own Story was a book which made a huge impact on me. And um, I think it's a very important book, actually, because it was the first book which sort of wrote in a completely frank way about the growing up of an ordinary person, um, a Midwestern gay teenager. Um, his confusions and self-hatred and sort of terrible act of betrayal which he, he commits at the, at the end of the, towards an older lover which he commits at the end of the book. The whole thing is done with a sort of unflinching honesty but also in a highly wrought almost baroque sort of language um, and that combination of, of, sort of on, honesty and artifice I, I, I found very sort of fair. I was rather thrown by it at first I wrote a rather snooty review of it in the TLS <laughs> um, I think I was sort of startled by, it, by its novelty but actually I was I hope absorbing its lessons it now seems to me to have been a very important book indeed um, there are other wonderful things which s sort of fell into that category of of the um, the ex excavation like uh, J.R. Ackerley's wonderful books, um, My Father and Myself, which was an exploration of his, his father had two families, neither of which knew about the other until after he died. Um, and Ackerley himself, who was a sort of pioneering sort of gay figure in the London literary scene, the great friend of Forster. Um, what other contemporary things were happening? Um, I mean, Adam Miles Jones's fictions were always very sort of brilliant and fascinating. Um, there seemed to, in a way to be more going on in America and there was more going on in France too which of course has a completely separate kind of culture of, of gay writing um, because of the Code Napoleon and the, um, you know, so they're you know, going back through Proust and Gide and so on. I mean I remember that I do remember that set so when writing my thesis at Oxford of sort of grubbing round for these sort of evidences of of gay life and on the page. Um, I think you were a fan of Denton Welch. Yeah. He's a kind of very singular life and a very singular writer. Very singular, yes. I, I wrote a big, a <laughs> big piece about, about Welch when a biography was, and his sort of complete journals were reissued in the early 80s. And, Tell us about uh, his strange biography. Well, Welch was a, a young gay man, uh, painter, um, writer, collector. He wrote an extraordinary uh, book called Maiden Voyage, which is very autobiographical about going to China as a boy with his parents. Um, he suffered a, a, a cycling accident. He was knocked off his bicycle by a lorry and suffered a spinal injury, which uh, incapacitated him to a greater or lesser extent for the rest of his life, and as, as a result of which he died very young. I can't remember quite how old he was. Um, but he was a writer of extraordinary sort of um, clear-eyed brilliance, an almost sort of amoral sense of describing exactly what, what he or his characters are thinking and feeling and what things look like. Um, and his journal is a marvellous account of, especially of the wartime, Second World War period, um, and sort of admiring, usually admiring from a slight distance, uh, young men found on his sort of cycle ride through Kent. Um, and his affairs with uh, one or two people, a man called Eric Oliver in particular, their, their love letters were recently published. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he's a very good example of a, a sort of cult writer too, actually, and, and um, William Burroughs was um, a great f fan of Denton Welch, um, and I think he, he is probably not someone who's ever going to be widely read, but will, will be always immensely valued by you know, those who've discovered him. It's very interesting what you say about revivals and disappearances because he, I think Denton Welch is about to become a, a Penguin classic. The Last Coast is Queer, we had a panel where we, one of our conclusions was we, there are so many books that have gone out of print that readers would love now. 
and somebody, <laughs> please, anyone watching, could, could come along and, and publish these at relatively little expense. I think you were involved in Fairbanks becoming a, a Penguin classic, is that right? Yeah, I mean, I've been very, very interested in Ronald Fairbank from an early age, and he was one of the writers that I wrote about in my Oxford thesis back in the mid-70s. Um, I think actually a very important writer, uh, our first real modernist writer, um, in whom this sort of breakup of all the conventions of the novel, writing writing these sort of frag fragmentary, lapidary, um, very camp, um, short short novels, was itself a sort of symbolic rejection of the prevailing moral order. Um, they're brilliantly funny. Um, quite difficult, the early books. I mean, they're very experimental. Um, an extraordinary figure in himself, um, sort of orchidaceous, heavy drinking, nomadic dandy. Um, uh, again, I think I'm resigned to the fact that he will never be a widely popular writer, but I do think that he's an extremely important one, not only for his extremely entertaining books, but for the impact that he had. And I, I was reading Vile Bodies again quite recently, and I mean, the first 50 pages of Vile Bodies could almost have come from a Fairbank novel, and the influence is so strong and direct. Um, but uh, he influenced a lot of uh, Anthony Pohl, who was responsible for his being re republished. Fairbank died in 1926 at the age of 40. Um, and um, yes, I, I, di I did an, a, a, an edition of the, his last three novels for Penguin Modern Classics, um, I think about 20 years ago, which within about nine months went out of print. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there was a, there was a, it's exactly what, what we're talking about, the, yeah. the re rediscovery <clears throat> and disappearance. I hadn't expected the disappearance to be quite so good. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> and I, I think that, pe that Penguin, Penguin Bond classic is now almost as hard to find as the, the very beautiful, rare first editions of Fairbank. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to ask about how you structure your novels. They're full of puzzles and omissions and things happening off stage. And I wondered, why is it, do you think, that you so enjoy a riddle? Oh, yes. Um, I have ambiguous feelings about riddles, yes. I mean, I think the, the idea of, of the, the hidden thing, which you have to try and puzzle out, is, is you know, quite, quite a deep thing in, in fiction. And um, you know, at its most explicit, obviously, it's in a detective story or something. Um, and you know, it, it is a kind of convention, and that, you know, it, it, even in the enormous sort of machinery of a Dickens novel, there will, there will be some deeply buried secrets, often also loudly signalled secrets, uh, which are all finally revealed in, in, in the last episode. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that I've wanted to do in sort of slightly sort of querying the, the, the pitch with, with sort of plot construction and so on was, was to have mysteries which are sort of solved in, in the text. And mysteries um, that are not solved. Yeah, and mysteries which are not solved. Yeah. And often, I think in the first two books in particular, they rather follow that, that model. There's a big revelation just before the end. And then there's a sort of coda in which something else happens and, and yes. things are sort of left in the air. Why do you like to finish books in that way? The, people do hang around for a, sh a little coda afterwards. Yeah. What, what appeals to you about that? I think, is it just a sort of... Well, I suppose it's a way of signalling that real life doesn't actually have the... follow the conventions, the formal conventions of, of, uh, of, of the novel and, and that the novel can sort of gest gesture to, um, to the incoherence of life sort of beyond its pages. I think that was, became a big preoccupation with The Strangest Child, actually, which is uh, about this uncovering of, of the past, but with these big gaps in the story. I mean, one, the five episodes of the book have a big, long periods in between them. In one case, I think more than 40 years. So there's a huge amount which the reader never discovers about, about the story, what, what happened. And I like the idea of sort of inviting the reader to speculate about what's happened in these, these periods and, and each new section of the book pitches you into a new period and a new place and you have to take up the reader has to take a while to sort of work out where the hell we are and what's going on when it's happening um, but I like the sense of, of 
you know, not in a, I hope, a tediously teasing way, but sort of keeping things from from the reader and some, actually just making the novel more like life and less like a novel, you know, um, which you know, there's so little that we fully understand about the lives even of those people very close to us. Um, so that that sense that ignorance about life is also part of, of the finding out about life, which happens in a novel, rather appeals to me. Mm. Tantalizing ignorance. I like that. Um, well, we only got time for a few more questions, so I'd, I'd like to bring us to the here and now. And over the, you know, in the last couple of years, I, I've noticed an absolute explosion in the number of queer books being published. Um, hallelujah. It's great. I'm sure many of them are being sent to you, seeking your admiration. What are you reading now and what's worth our viewers' attention, do you think? Well, I've just read and written a big piece about this young American writer, Brian Washington, um, black Houstonian writer, um, who I think is sort of a genius, actually. Um, he's only in his late 20s. He published a book of short stories called Lot mm. a couple of years ago, um, which are almost all about or gay life or seen from the point of view of a, of a young gay narrator. Um, I think one of the most brilliant debut I've read for a long time, actually. Each story takes its name from a different area of Houston, which is actually a city I know a bit, so it had a certain sort of nostalgic interest. Um, but he writes about a sort of underclass of immigrants, a sort of hard, hard scrabble end of the, the rather um, prosperous economy of, of Houston. Um, seen from extraordinary angles with amazing economy. Um, and he's just brought out a, his first novel called Memorial, which is about a, a relationship between a, also set in Houston, between a black man and a Japanese American man, um, and exploring this relationship, which neither of them quite knows why they're having it, but they don't want it to end. And it's, um, it has a very sort of contemporary texture. It's again rather rather fragmentary and um, but but technically extremely in interesting. Um, I think he's really someone to watch out for. Um, I mean, the glorious success of Douglas Stewart's Shaggy Bane uh, is, has been a great source of, of rejoicing. Um, I'm getting getting a that that thrill of the of the really good debut, you know, where you're introduced to a new world, a new subject, and a new imagination. Uh, in his case, with amazing sort of powers of language as well. It's, it's just one of the great, great pleasures of reading. Really. Well, I want to ask you about Douglas Stewart because we're thrilled that he he's uh, he opened the festival. Actually, um, what an amazing uh, six months he's had <laughs> winning yes, the book exactly. of his debut novel. <laughs> Do you have any of you, you on the book of yourself in 2004 for the line of beauty? Do you have any advice for him in in sort of the context of the deluge of attention and uh, uh, he'll be subject to? I'm not sure that he needs advice. He seems an extremely sort of confident and established sort of well balanced person from what I've seen of him. Um, I don't know. Of course, I mean he's getting all this attention under these very peculiar pandemic conditions. So. Um, he won't be able to do the, the thing which I do, which was herring around the world for two years talking about myself and my book. Um, he'll just have to be sitting at home in New York. Uh, it's very, very strange for him. And I, I'm sorry, in a way, he's not having all that travel and excitement. Um, but I'm sure he's got excitement enough. I hope he feels, um, as I did, that, that winning the prize... I mean, people sometimes say, you know, was it difficult to write a book after winning the Walker Prize? Because, again, this question of expectations on you. Um, and my feeling was exactly the opposite, that this was a sort of encouragement to me to do whatever I wanted. Um, and I ho hope he will feel now that the world is his oyster and that he can go on and write an even more marvellous second book. Fantastic, thank you. Now, Coast is Queer is produced by Marlborough Productions and New Writing South. And New Writing South's job is to help new writers develop. So I wondered if you had any practical advice for budding authors watching who are just starting out. I'm so wary of giving advice because I think that this, the best advice is rather personal, you know. Um, and one person needs to be told to go easy on something; the other needs to be told to do a lot more of it. Um, so I think good advice is rather rudimentary. And if it's advice about writing fiction that we're talking about, then it's that 
thing we touched on earlier about stamina and sticking at it, you know. Um, it's a big undertaking writing a, a novel. Um, it's also a completely enthralling one. Um, my, you know, different writers, different good writers have completely different practices. Um, mine has always been to, to do a lot of preparation and plan a book quite carefully before starting it um, and never showing anything or giving anything away about it. I'm just warning you. Um, <laughs> uh, until, I've, until I've finished it. Um, again, it's that old thing. I was perhaps an attempt to recreate that thing with the first book, you know, of having this sort of secret place that I can go to and mess around it without anybody knowing what I'm doing. Um, and then there it is. Um, but there are other you know, marvellous writers who thrive on constant interaction and showing things to people. And, um, but I think it's just, you know, start and then keep on. <laughs> That's <is> really the <laughs> best advice. It's a big undertaking, whatever the scale of the novel. But yes. the, 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 the scale of your novels is large and it's, it's got larger. Have you ever wanted to write a novella? Long to write a novella, yeah. Um, I've been wanting, every time in my last three books, I think I've, I've started out to write, perhaps not quite a novella, but something of about 250 pages. And um, they've all ended up being at least twice that. So um, it's, it's absolutely infuriating. Um, I console myself that it's what happened with Henry James, a great idol of mine, and who, who would propose a book when novels were published in installments and say, this will be 10 installments or so. And so then when he was getting to the end of the 15th installment, it was good. Um, uh, it's the thing, of course, of the subject, however well you've planned it, sort of inevitably gaining in interest once you actually get into it. Um, I feel I must have a short novel somewhere inside me, but I seem only able to <laughs> write this great big fat one. Well, returning to that idea of revivals and disappearances, my last question is about posterity. As queer people, many of us won't have children. I think we have a strange and quite special relationship with what comes after us, actually. We'll leave other things behind instead. Um, do you see your books that way? And what do you hope they'll offer to readers like us, queer readers, I mean, in 100 years' time? The world in, in 10 years' time is almost unimaginable, isn't it? So what the real world in 100 years' time is going to be like, I don't know. I have to say, I never think in those terms. Well, that isn't just a sort of... False modesty. I, I, um, what happens to my books after after I'm gone? Um, even when I'm old, I, I find it quite hard to focus on. Um, they're they're written. I'm delighted that they've all always remained in print and um, seem to have been appreciated. Um, I mean, doing this talk now, and you were talking about 1988, and, you know, which is 30, 33 years ago next month that my first novel came out, and it does seem to me um, like something that was written by another person. You know, it seemed feels so long ago, um, and I'm delighted that people still read it and that it seems to have new new meanings as as time moves on. Um, but I think it's it's sort of vain and really impossible to think about about what's what's posterity well alan i think that your books will be read in 100 years thank you thank you so much this has been a lovely discussion um we're so delighted you could join us at the festival oh, it's thank been you re really thank nice you. to do it and really nice to do it at this particular moment and to to feel it feel in touch with you and and anybody who's watching thank you thanks a lot <laughs>